So, welcome, first of all, to everybody. It's an honor for me to open this side event on the important topic, the role, protection, and effective participation of human rights defenders in development. And we're very pleased to co-host this event with the International Service for Human Rights. Today's panel includes the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders and the Chair of the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, two mandates sponsored by Norway. And as we will hear, the efforts underway in these two crucial areas, Human Rights Defenders and Business and Human Rights, are closely linked and aim to reinforce each other. Unfortunately, the situation for human rights defenders working on economic, social and cultural rights has in many areas worsened since the previous report on this topic by the Special Rapporteur. This trend runs contrary to sustainable development. We therefore need to enhance our collective efforts in these areas on the basis of the good work undertaken by the mandate holders. The facts are there before us, and they are cause of grave concern. Before giving the floor to today's moderator and the panelists, let me make a few general points. First, our aim in this area is not to establish new rights or privilege for human rights defenders. As underlined by the GA two years ago, human rights defenders can play a substantial role to strengthen development. But at the same time, the GA expressed deep concern for their difficult situation as they frequently face threats, attacks, and acts of intimidation, which have severe negative impacts on their work and their safety. This is unacceptable under any standards. For this reason, human rights defenders have special protection needs in their work on the basis of non-discrimination and on the basis of the fundamental freedoms and human rights that apply to everyone. Second, Governments do not always have to agree with human rights defenders, but they must allow them to speak and allow for an open debate. Fundamental freedoms of expressions and association are essential also for the promotion and protection of the more material rights, economic, social, cultural. Creating a safe and enabling environment for human rights defenders should therefore be a fundamental objective of any society. Transparent decision-making and flow of information, accept for differences in views to be heard and for effective participation by various stakeholders in our societies will make for better policy-making processes, which in end leads to better decision-making, to better decisions, and ultimately to more effective and more sustainable development in the longer term. Third. <laughs> A human rights-based approach to development requires coordination and policy coherence. And policy coherence starts at home. The work under the two mandates are most relevant also in this light. And this relates to all of us. We look forward to hearing the presentations on these issues here today. But before giving the floor to my colleague here, let me take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks and gratitude to Mr. Mar Margaret Sekagia for her tireless efforts for the defense of human rights over the past six years. This will be your final appearance here in New York. Mm. And I think it's safe to say that you have had a real impact during a very difficult time for human rights defenders and also you moved the, this whole agenda further into your work. You have worked to give real impetus, traction on the ground under most challenging circumstances. And your recommendations have been a key basis of important UN resolutions. Indeed, we hope to adopt a clear resolution also at this session for the protection of women human rights defenders. So on this note, let me give the floor to today's moderator, Mr. Arvan Ganesha. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, thank you. And I'd just like to thank again the Government of Norway and the International Service for Human Rights for organizing this panel today. This is, uh, just by way of introduction, I am the Business and Human Rights Director of Human Rights Watch, and our work frequently touches on issues related to human rights and development. And for me, I see this as a great opportunity today to learn more about the issues from some global experts who have been looking at this issue around the world. So what I'd like to do is just briefly introduce our panel, 
and then we will open it up uh, first to some questions by me, introductory questions, but we would like to make this an interactive exchange. So we, we definitely would like to open it up to the floor, and as I understand, we even have people online who may be submitting questions. And I hope over the course of the next hour, hour and a half, we get a real opportunity to discuss one of the critical issues in human rights today. So with that, I will, I'll introduce people from my right to left. And just as a reminder, the, the chairman of the Working Group on Business and Human Rights will be speaking in Russian today. So we will have translation for that. Um, on my right is uh, Mr. Pavel Sulenziga, um, the chairman of the Working Group on Business and Human Rights. The Working Group was a critical step in the evolution of business and human rights and was founded in 2011. And in the course of its work, looking at the, the, the new guidelines on business and human rights and under its mandate, one of the things that is highlighted is the role of human rights defenders and also the problem of human rights issues related to development projects. Um, next to him is Margaret Sekagayev, sorry, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, who we all know and has extensively documented threats and attacks against human rights defenders in the context of development. Um, and we look forward to hearing from her as well today about her experiences and, and the cases she's working on. And then obviously we have the ambassador who was kind enough to host us. Thank you again. And, and then to her left is Cristina Fernandez, who is based in Mexico and, and focuses on the defense and promotion of human rights, in particular in relation to women. And she'll be providing her experience and perspectives on how, how issues of development in human rights and human rights defenders uh, interact. And just as an introduction before I start with the questions, I just wanted to give a brief context of some of the ways that we are seeing these issues come to the fore. And it starts with a basic premise, which is that in today's world, many countries and many individuals are seeking greater development, understandably and justifiably so. At the same time, there are more people in today's world and there is more pressure on land and resources and competition over them. Inevitably, that will lead to problems. And in some cases, that will lead to human rights problems. And in that context, whether it's a mining project or whether it's a project funded by an international institution like the World Bank, or an agricultural project that requires large use of land for agricultural use, but sometimes will displace communities that were already there, there is an intersection between development and human rights that is undeniable and may be growing. And in that context, human rights defenders are often the first people to point out that there is a conflict occurring, and as a result, maybe the first people under threat when it occurs, including the local communities who might be victimized by it. And in a world that is growing on a number of different levels, there is no reason to believe that this will diminish. And that's why it is centrally important to both recognize the phenomenon, but also recognize the people who are highlighting and monitoring these issues. And with that, what I would like to do is just turn it over to the panelists for a question each, and then we will open it up to the floor. So starting with the working group itself, one of the things that the working group has touched upon is potential human rights threats to indigenous peoples in the context of development. And I just wanted to ask a basic question, which is, can you describe some of the circumstances that the working group is seeing around the world that intersect with these issues on human rights and development, but also with indigenous people? Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I would also like to express my gratitude to the organizers and to the government and mission of Norway for having organized this side event. In fact, our working group in its report to the Human Rights Council noted that recently there has been a stepping up of pressure on human rights defenders, on organizations of people who are protecting and defending human rights be they communities of indigenous peoples or local populations or individuals who are suffering as a result of the activities of business. Therefore, it is extremely important today to consider and reflect on this question in the light of the fact that such violations are becoming ever more frequent. 
As for my report, which on behalf of our working group I submitted yesterday, a report dedicated to issues of the rights of indigenous peoples and business, I would like once again to note, as I stated yesterday, that indigenous peoples, to some extent, are in fact in the vanguard of the development here of both entrepreneurial activity and those lands and territories in which today their populations live. Today, in many countries, the economies are developing at the expense of the extraction of natural resources. And moreover, that mining and extraction of natural resources is bringing in huge income and benefits both to states and to the companies. Many territories on which indigenous peoples are leaving are in fact very rich in these kind of natural resources. And we understand very well that this we understand that and that definition as defined by the UN of indigenous peoples as those also who have a very close tie to the land. And when those lands are devastated and destroyed, those links and the links to the peoples themselves are destroyed. So at the meeting of our working group, we took a decision, in fact, to devote our time to that subject of the problem of indigenous peoples and business. Today, to great regret, this issue is becoming an enormous one. Therefore, for my part, I would like to note that the international community, including the United Nations, has been undertaking numerous efforts in order to ensure that the rights of indigenous peoples are complied with. And I should like to take note of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Work on that declaration went on over 17 years. I would also like to note that today, within the framework of the UN system, there is the Permanent Forum on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which has been established. There is a special rapporteur. There is an expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, and these are UN bodies which are attempting to ensure monitoring and to assist the indigenous people in enjoying their rights. I also would like to say that one of the very important active and effective mechanisms for the protection of the human rights of indigenous peoples is that today a whole series of financial institutions such as the World Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the American Bank, International Finance Corporation and others, in their internal guidelines and policies, are in fact taking decisions in order to comply with and preserve the rights of indigenous peoples. This is a huge lever to assist in the protection of the rights of indigenous peoples. Today we already have examples when we see that major companies, major corporations are negotiating with communities of indigenous peoples on how, on what basis, in what conditions these companies will, in fact, be working out various projects on the territory of indigenous peoples. So these companies are not doing this just because they're so nice and cozy and cute and comfortable. Rather, they're trying to get loans and credits from these international financial institutions. And that's why they are willing to comply with the rights of indigenous peoples and carry on such negotiations. So I think it is very important that these policies be extended not only to the international financial institutions, but also to private financial institutions, private banks, private foundations and funds the ones who are financing various projects throughout the world. I think that this is affecting not only indigenous peoples, or should not only affect indigenous peoples, this should affect all people who, in fact, are subject to the effect of such projects, be it the local population, the workers in these companies, their employees, and other individuals living on the territory where these projects are being carried out or shall be carried out. Therefore, I believe that people who are bearing the brunt of the burden to 
protect and guard human rights, first and foremost, the defenders of human rights and the human rights organizations, they need to be ensured of the support and protection from outside. They also need society's protection because they, first and foremost, they are the first to bear the blows which today are raining down on such organizations. Thank you very much. I wanted to follow up with a question to the special rapporteur. On, on her report, and in particular that she noted that human rights defenders in large-scale development projects face some serious threats, including physical threats, when they highlight problems related to them. And I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate more on some of the cases and circumstances when that's occurred. Um, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this panel uh, around my report on large-scale development and the effect it has on human rights defenders. I want to thank Norway for continuously uh, helping and supporting my mandate and ISHR for their efforts to take into account many of the reports which I've presented either to the General Assembly or to the Human Rights Council. He, over the past five years, which I've been a special rapporteur, I've seen a worrisome trend of uh, violations against human rights defenders who work on large-scale development uh, projects. Um, if uh, some of you remember, at one time I presented a report here on the issue of non-state actors and the effect it had on the work of human rights defenders, and still a subject like that came up about uh, defenders working on large-scale uh, projects. Human rights defenders working on these projects are usually targeted. They are harassed, they are threatened, they are intimidated, sometimes they are killed, both by state and non-state actors. And in many instances, you find that those who are affected most are those working on land issues or issues of natural resources and environment. And these targeting and uh, threats do not spare women human rights defenders who are usually very vulnerable in these, in, in these circumstances. So women human rights defenders, in addition, suffer even more uh, threats and intimidation, but also on top of that you find particular abuses which are carried out against women like uh, sexual abuse, uh, rape, and uh, uh, very serious uh, crimes against them. In many instances uh, we've uh, documented at, um, at our office instances of some of the examples of some of these issues which have come out. And I can give you um, a few examples. In Azerbaijan, there was a journalist and a reporter who was attacked and beaten unconscious by state oil company security staff when he filmed uh, a confrontation between security staff and residents whose houses were being demolished to develop oil resources. He, his brother and colleagues were also attacked. And you can see how human rights defenders really suffer in these instances. In Guatemala, uh, a case um, involving mining, there was an attempted killing of a woman, a woman human rights defender who is also one of the most prominent activists uh, of a community initiative in the local inhabitants, who was defending their area um, on environmental issues, again, by the expansion of the mining activities 
the perpetrators attempted to kill this woman, human rights defenders. In Thailand, uh, this was involving plantation. There were killings of two members of the peasant movements who were involved in uh, land rights disputes between their community and a palm oil company in the vicinity of their village. Their community was previously targeted with violent incidents, including threats and intimidation, believed to be linked to their land rights activities, and the perpetrators were unknown. During my mandate, I've also been traveling a lot and having, going for country visits, and some of the countries which I found serious challenges, like in Honduras, those who were working on land issues, environmental issues, were particularly targeted, and it's, it was a serious concern, which I put in my report, for people working on land rights in Honduras. India also has problems on uh, issues of, of the construction of dams, and you find that access to information and people working, uh, indigenous people uh, and uh, particularly people living in those areas are, re are usually ignored when these particular big projects are being carried out. And anyone trying to uh, bring out issues of human rights defenders and opposing the projects are sometimes accused to belong to Maoists or to belong to the opposition, to be opposing government developments. So these are serious cases which usually come out to, which affects the work of human rights defenders. And there are many more in different countries in the inter-American region, as you know, and some of the other countries coming up in Africa, which involve oil, extraction of oil, where defenders are basically targeted. But the major problem is the fact that when the government is initially planning these projects, that the people are not well ahead consulted and they do not participate in the design and in the impact assessment of these projects. And you'll find that in, later on, the government then comes to take action and tell people either to move or that they should be compensated to leave. And you find that the, the actual participation of the people has not been there at the initial stage. And though for those who have read my report, you'll find a big recommendation on the fact that defenders and the communities should be consulted at every stage of the, of the project at the design of the project, at the implementation, and at the monitoring and evaluation to avoid these particular problems. Issues of non-discrimination come in to take into account very vulnerable people, as I've already pointed out, issues of women should be taken into account because most of them depend on this land. That's where they get their livelihood, that's where they live, that's where they get all their resources. So these are some of the issues that defenders, sometimes, as I've said in the report, are even accused of being anti-development, anti of being against the government, just because of the work they do, just because of the opposition they have against these projects. But we have to find a solution, and the solution is participation, transparency, non-discrimination, and ensuring that the human rights defenders and those affected are uh, consulted at every stage. Thank you so much. Um, Christina, you, your organization is a, is a founding member of the Mesoamerican Women's Human Rights Defenders Initiative and works to protect women from violence and, and other abuses. Now, in the context of development, what kinds of challenges are, are you seeing in, in the course of your work? Uh, muchas gracias. First, I want to thank the invitation on behalf of the Jazz Association and for the Mesoamerican Initiative. 
uh, for being here. Uh, we are overwhelmed with the invitation, and of course, it's a privilege for us to be here. Uh, regarding the first uh, the question, I will start with one uh, phrase that I uh, found in the report of Oxfam that says that in the region, more than 60% of the world's poorest people live in countries rich in natural resources, but they rarely share in the world. Oil, gas, and mining projects can have significant impacts host communities and the environment. Large-scale resource projects offer the potential to bring opportunity for citizens of the nations where the resources are being developed. Unfortunately, the poorest and most vulnerable communities in many cases, including indigenous communities, often are excluded from these benefits that might be generated by these activities and are the communities most burdened by the costs. Too often, communities have no say in this decision or whether they two extra resources from their land and receive little information about these projects. In regions like in Latin America, the transition of democracy has not been consolidated, giving rise to new forms of authoritarianism and militarization. Civil protest has increasingly been criminalized, freedom of expression restricted, and opportunities for citizen participation in policy making is limited. In this context, powerful not state actors, such as religion hierarchies, organized crime, and transnational business monopolies have gradually increased their influence and control over public authorities and institutions, as well as over the decisions they make. Explicit death threats against women human rights defenders are the principal form of violence in the region according to the UN Special Rapporteur of the Situation of Human Rights Defenders. In the last year, the Mesoamerican Initiative has tried to present the faces of the women who are facing these threats. We found in a, 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 a diagnostic made in 2012, we registered 414 attacks committed with women human rights defenders. 40% of them were women who work in rural areas, and we found out that these are the particular regions where the human rights defenders re receive the most aggressions. The other rest is in the urban areas. We found out also that the women human rights defenders who receive the most threats are the ones who are denouncing mega projects, who are organizing the communities or are organizing their families to defend their lands. Who are these women? They are women in mostly communities indigenous who are not getting paid for the work they are doing. There are women who are defending their territory, defending their life, and def de defending our environment. These women have families and are working hard to denounce the lack of, of transparency of the government and the companies that are trying to implement projects in their communities. It is important to note that all NOR attacks are registered, and sometimes the problems that women human rights defenders face are the possibilities to denounce and to, and to inform to other organizations and to act, state actors what is happening in their communities. It's remote zones, regions that we cannot sometimes imagine or we are forgetting about the situation they are facing. So finally, uh, to, to give space to, to the discussion, uh, we would like to say that one of the most concerning issues that we are facing now is the ma mining projects. This is a big issue in the whole region and it's causing a lot of social conflicts. Thank you. writes that also that the government of Norway has submitted a resolution on women human rights defenders for the third committee and I wanted to highlight that both in the context of this session but also in general as well so thank you for that um, I would uh, we are webcasting this uh, session 
So I'd like to open it up to the floor, if possible, for questions. And I would just ask that as you ask questions, please introduce yourself and your organization as well. So I'll first go to the floor, and, and Madeline will be monitoring online in case we have some interesting questions coming up online as well. So I'd like to open it up to the floor to ask our experts uh, any questions related to human rights defenders and development. Right there. Please. Thank, you for, thank you for this presentation. I've been listening with great interest. My name is Jocelyn Madayo, and I'm with the Center for International Environmental Law. So I'd like to make a comment and then and ask a question. So first I want to say that um, together with partners, including International Accountability Project, the International Network for Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, and Human Rights Watch, um, we are launching a global campaign to ensure that development finance respects human rights. And I've been quite interested in this discussion because one thing that we're promoting is the use of human rights impact assessments in development finance projects. So our first or our primary focus for our global campaign that we're launching right now is the World Bank, so public sector finance, um, because the bank is undergoing a review of its environmental and social safeguard policies, which are, which are global standards. Um, one other thing that the bank is doing is they have recently launched a strategy, a World Bank Group strategy, um, and it it pretty much says that the bank will be increasing risks, it, it has a need to increase risks, that it will be increasing and deepening um, interventions in fragile conflict-affected states. So these are the states by, that by the very definition present the most challenging development environments. Um, poor governance, political instability, and frequently continuing violence from a legacy of post-conflict. The World Bank is also saying that they, through this strategy, that they will increase um, the need for large transformational projects, large development projects. So this raises a concern for us um, because if not managed effectively, this can really result in serious human rights risks and violations. So my question is, in the context of public finance, um, how does the panel, how, what are the panel's opinions on how to ensure the protection and effective participation of human rights defenders in like World Bank projects moving forward? Thank you. Um, since, since the chair of the working group mentioned the role of international financial institutions, maybe I'll ask you if, if you have some thoughts on that first. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I didn't quite get the question. The question was, how can the development banks, the World Bank and others, better protect human rights and incorporate human rights impact assessments, for example, into their work? Thank you very much for this question. But you said in your statement that, for example, now the World Bank is working, in fact, on changes in its policy and on introducing new changes and additions and amendments. And for my part, I could say that the World Bank, in principle, organized rather good consultations with the indigenous peoples taking into account the views, ideas, and proposals of indigenous peoples. For my part, I would like to say that when we made our report for the Human Rights Council and provided recommendations to the various stakeholders, including state companies, financial institutes, and civil society, one of our recommendations was to promote institutional strengthening of human rights organizations. We think that this is very important because both I and Margaret in our introductory statements said that human rights defenders recently are increasingly being subjected to threats of violence integrated from business. So I think that in considering 
and in moving forward various kinds of projects for these financial institutions, not only these financial institutions, but your question referred to them, but I also think it's important that in the context of those social programs which now exist within those financial institutions, it would be important to point to programs on the development of human rights activities to back this and reinforce these programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask actually Margaret, uh, Margaret about a, a variation on this issue, which is, is there a way for the multilateral banks, say the World Bank, to take steps to better protect human rights defenders as they finance projects around the world? I think if you read in my report, you realize that I've strategically mentioned that if you handle this issue, you must introduce a human rights-based approach. And what does the human rights-based approach entail? Because that's when you will be able to protect everyone. First of all, a human rights-based approach brings in the issue of consultation, of participation of the communities of human rights defenders at the initial design of the project, as I said. The issue of participation is a human rights issue. Then the issue of transparency. So all, at the, every stage when you are drawing up the agreements, all those should be on the table. People should know what is in those agreements, the contracts, the subcontracting. Who is going to do it? How are they going to do it? How does it affect the communities? And how will they benefit from those projects? The issue of access to information. The defenders and the communities should know. They should be able to access this information. As you know, most of the countries, they think that these, this information is only for the government and the contractors or the, the big companies. But the communities should know what is there. There must be transparency. There must be access to information. And then there must also be uh, ways of uh, redress. In case any complaint, the communities m need to make any complaints if they have issues about the project. What are the mechanisms in place to receive these complaints? How are they being handled? Are the violations being addressed? Are those perpetrators being brought to book? Are they being prosecuted if they have violations? Are there investigations which are being carried out and they must be prompt and impartial? So that at every stage you have someone handling the issue. If there is any complaint, then you bring it up and there are mechanisms. So you have to strengthen these mechanisms which are looking at addressing the violations and then there must be a remedy in case a violation has been carried out. So if you bring the perpetrators to book, is there a remedy? Are the mechanisms, whether judicial or administrative, in position to give remedy to the violations which are carried out? And maybe lastly, it's important for the communities, for the defenders to, to, to to be understood. So their role and the, part, the, the, the part they are playing in the whole process should be made uh, known to government officials, to policy makers. If it's for exercising, for example, freedom of assembly, uh, if they want to protest, are those uh, security agencies trained in handling these issues so that they don't use excessive force. Because of course, you know, once these projects come up, people protest. They want to exercise their rights to denounce the project or to air their views. So are these security agencies trained in how to handle these people? So these are all the issues which under a human rights based approach to carrying out such a project. Thank you. I wanted to ask 
Christina, building on that, um, and then we have a question from online. In, in your experience, we know, for example, that the International Finance Corporation right now is investigating a situation with an agribusiness company in Honduras. But in your experience, working with women's human rights defenders, do you see a role for the multilateral development banks, or do you see where their policies or practices need to be stronger? Um, in the interviews we are having with uh, most of the women human rights defenders who are facing aggressions in contexts where, uh, where they are denouncing the um, companies or state non-state actors imposing mega projects, we found out that it's very complicated to link the periphery with the central. So most of the cases, the problem is that locally, what is happening, uh, the aggressions and the corruption that some companies are uh, making in, in the communities doesn't easily get out. So for instance, the World Bank or the Inter-American Bank normally does not know really what is happening in the field. So one of the challenges, it's been what mechanisms do we have to make so this company, so the international finances can go and see really in the field what is happening. The second one is that uh, impunity is really one of the most uh, problematic uh, elements in the, in the context. Locally in, and nationally, the, the organizations that are denouncing face the problem that they will, not, uh, they will not have guarantees if they go and denounce what is happening. So impunity has been contributing to an increased number of attacks and threats and other violations against human rights defenders. So one of the... The other um, elements that we are trying to, to integrate in the analysis and that it has to be a responsibility also of the companies and uh, for the financial is how to assure that the judicial system is effective in the denounce of these aggressions. Uh, a question from online from Phil Lynch from the International Service for Human Rights in Geneva and I'll, I'll pose it to the chairman. Do the UN guiding principles need to be strengthened to better protect human rights defenders when they're working on issues related to corporations? As you possibly know, those of you who are following the news uh, in the area of uh, interrelations between human rights and business, uh, that the last session on human rights, uh, a number of countries, including Ecuador, made a proposal to uh, develop a mandatory international document uh, regulating the relations between human rights and business. The uh, working group will be uh, considering this proposal. We uh, are uh, conducting consultations uh, with the adherents of our working group and we have a good relationship with a number of non-governmental organizations I am convinced uh, that it is important to continue work in this area. Before I go back to the floor, I just wanted to ask if, if either of our panelists wanted to weigh in on the question at all. Strengthening the, Strengthening the guiding principles for human rights defense. Um, I think before strengthening the guiding principles, we really ne need 
these principles to be more disseminated, more known to human rights defenders. I know that the Working Group on Human Rights and Business has set these principles, but I must confess that if I go around meeting defenders and people in governments, I don't think they are all well known to human rights defenders. So um, the first thing I would think about before strengthening, we look at them and see they're already applicable, they talk about the best practices, is how do we get them be known to the policy makers, to the, the corporations, to the human rights defenders themselves? And I think they should also be translated in the language that human rights defenders understand so that they will be able to know this is what's available to us, which we can use as a tool in our demanding for our rights. As well as the governments also, we should make sure that when they are designing these uh, projects and contracts, they take cognizant of the fact that these uh, guidelines are available and they should be taken into account. So the first thing is dissemination, translating, simplifying, putting them in the language that the defenders understand and that the governments also follow them. I fully agree with Margaret. I would also like to refer to the fact that recently we received a proposal from an organization which brings together indigenous peoples of Asia to the effect that we should m translate the guidelines into the 42 languages of the peoples here and the indigenous peoples of Central Asia and of Asia and we've supported that and it is my view and my hope that together with the indigenous peoples of Asia we'll be able to organize this project so that the guidelines will be translated into all of the languages of the indigenous peoples of the entire world. Thank you. Any comments? Then the floor for any questions. Uh, back there, please. And please remember to introduce yourself and your organization. My name is uh, Kamal Fahmi. I am from Set My People Free. I am thankful for this opportunity here. And I also was very impressed by the leverage you use for, for this uh, with, with land development and so on. And, and my wish that this kind of leverage and pressure on government will be used also for freedom of thought and conscience. Because actually, one of the <laughs> what hinders development is very much freedom of thought and conscience and belief. But I'm thankful at least you are doing it in this area. And my recommendation, if we can have some kind, the same kind of leverage for freedom of thought and conscience will be tremendous. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I'm not... Um, I will see if anybody would like to speak to that. Otherwise, I will go back to the floor as well. Um, any? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we still have uh, different mandate holders dealing with such issues. So uh, I think early this morning, there was the special rapporteur on freedom of religion and cautious and all that. And uh, he usually holds very interesting panel discussions. Uh, I, I feel maybe you should also take advantage of his panel discussions. The, he really goes into those issues, and uh, you'll see that uh, you might find them also very useful. I'll open to the floor. Does anyone? On the opportunity, uh, my name is Budi Henawan from Franciscan International, and uh, we work with uh, our partners, in particularly in Asia and Latin America, who encountered uh, confronting with the problem with large corporations. And from the ground, we discovered uh, 
kind of major patterns in regards to corporations and in relation to business and states. First, most uh, corporations have operated for decades in the area of indigenous people communities. So in the, in the question about consent and prior or participation um, is rather recent when, so they, when they started their operations, those language did not exist first. Second, in many contexts like in Indonesia and the Philippines, India and Honduras, for example, uh, we found that uh, major corporations constitute large taxpayer in those countries. So states have very uh, big interest to keep them in safe. And national legislation don't really allow the human rights defenders in the local level or indigenous community to really confront uh, that reality. So my question to the panel is, in that kind of context, um, how do you ensure the compliance of states and corporations to really um, protect uh, human rights defenders in this uh, situation? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let, me, let me start with Margaret to see if she has any, any thoughts on the matter. Yes, it's, it's true that some of the developments have been ongoing, uh, but at the same time, and for example, I'll give you the example, I, was, I, I made a, a country visit to India, and there are many new projects, building dams, uh, construction, so it, it's not too late, even, even if some of the projects have been already going on, to really inject in these new values, these new uh, uh, ideas from the, uh, from the UN and from uh, the Special Rapporteur and things we are trying to, 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 to tell governments to do. It's not too late because development is always ongoing. And when do you improve? And defenders are now also coming up and demanding for their rights before a government will come and dictate, here we are going to start this project and we, 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 we want to, 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 to move you, we want to evict people from this area. But it's no longer the case because now human rights defenders and the indigenous populations and the communities also know their rights. I want to give you an example. I was in South Korea very recently and the government had started a project on nuclear power and they started uh, building the pylons, uh, uh, the big pylons from a long distance coming, approaching the communities. And then when they reached where the communities were living, they said, uh, we are going to build the pylons. And the communities said, no, you are not going to build these pylons because we do agriculture and our agriculture, we have to do irrigation by air uh, they use helicopters to irrigate their gardens, and once you build those pylons, we will not be able to, to, to irrigate our, our gardens, and therefore this is our livelihood. And the government was stuck because they were going to, to lose trillions of money to stop the project. And here they were in the middle of the project. They had already partially built the, the project, and they could not go on. Every day, the defenders went and sat in that place and camped and, 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 and refused to get the government to go on with the project. So does the government want to get in such an instance where it's going to lose because it couldn't go on with the project? Every day there were protests. The police were there uh, guarding and uh, tear gassing uh, the people. And I don't think this is what they want. So the best thing is to take into account the human rights based approach, consult, involve people right at the initial stage of the project, ensure that people understand the project. We do not want to say that defenders are against development, but we want them to understand that the project is also going to benefit them or it's going to take into account their issues. If it's an issue of eviction, 
where are these people going to be reallocated? What are the issues which come into play? So this is what it is. Pr development is always going on and it has never stopped. Even if these big companies pay a lot of taxes, but you, you, you don't do it at the expense of the communities, of their livelihood. What are the issues these big companies uh, taking into account? What, what, what strategies, what arrangements do they have for these people? Where they are going to do mining, where they are going to put dams? What, how are the people going to live? You don't just ignore them just because the government is going to get big taxes. The taxes are for the people, rights are for the people, and projects are for the people, not for the government. Thank you. I'll turn to Christina and then the chair if, if you have any thoughts on it. Just to say that uh, I think that every, in the last years, the social movements and the NGOs who are working in regions like in Latin America, for example, with uh, mega projects exclusively, um, they found out that they have allies like the Inter-American Commission or, or the Inter-American Court of Human Rights which are beginning to be now the replacement of the, of the judici judicial system in, in nationally, that it's not working or it's not responding when they are denouncing the imposition of mega projects. So I believe that these uh, resolutions are making a new uh, framework uh, for, the, for other regions. And also, I as I understand, recently in Canada also, there was a new uh, resolution uh, against Guatemala uh, in the companies, and it's been very uh, impressive, the impact that it's going to have for, for the region. So what I'm trying to, to say is that uh, there are new tools that are working for the region, and, and, and it will be important to disseminate more and more. And I believe that in some time, this, this will be the locks from these companies who are believing now to, to work with more impact. I wanted to add something, just giving you some of the best practices. Uh, which I also mentioned yesterday during my inter interactive dialogue. Uh, at the national level, Australia developed a Mining for Development Initiative, which incorporated environment and uh, social safeguards, as well as criteria for managing the impact for vulnerable groups and the assessment of direct benefits for communities. And again, also in my report, I mentioned Colombia, where the National Hydrocarbon Agency is required to spell out the methodology used to assess the impact of a project in effect, uh, taking into account the community and the way the project will benefit the communities. So some of these things, uh, as you see, you have to look at the best practices of others. And there is also positive initiatives. Often they do not require human rights approach or methodology, but they are used in impact assessment. There is, for example, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. The, this is a multi-stakeholder initiative. Or, and this is used also to contribute in changing corporate culture and practice and it offers interesting lessons learned. It will be good to look at the best practices and see what do other countries which have those projects, how do they uh, handle their issues, how do they get on to, to take into account community uh, issues, cultural issues, in, instead of just dictating and thinking that the large companies should do whatever they want. It's, it's very important that they look at best practices. And Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. 
I would like to share some of my personal experience. As I started out my political career, I was uh, somebody fighting for the rights of uh, my people, my community, my indigenous minority. As we were fighting against having our land being given to South Korea for a 30-year term. That was in 1989, during the times of the Soviet Union. What I would like to say is this. I think to uh, really understand progress and how we can accomplish progress, it is important to increase the potential of indigenous communities, of indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, it is not infrequent that indigenous peoples are also the poorest, the weakest. Uh, obviously, they are a vulnerable group, but we must understand uh, that they are also actors under international law. I would like to refer to some examples. You have mentioned that large companies and large corporations are major taxpayers and contribute more to the budget. Yes, this is true, but it is important to understand what indigenous peoples are after, whether they want a project to be implemented or not. Uh, talking about the project in Canada, for 17 years, a project on pipeline construction was discussed. The pipeline was supposed uh, to uh, cross seven areas belonging to uh, uh, Inuit Indian tribes. Uh, Exxon Marble, Shell, and some other large companies discussed the issue and wound up creating a joint stock company which owned the pipeline. I believe that 39% of the stock uh, belong to the Indians themselves. Four members of the board of directors are also representatives of those Indian tribes. This is a very positive example. Another example, in Sakhalin, in Russia, a multi-billion project for shelf oil, billions of dollars, a serious clash of interests of different corporations and the indigenous people communities. They started blocking roads not to admit trucks into the area uh, to make sure that construction does not take place. The uh, company doing the construction had to start a negotiation with representatives of those indigenous peoples. Yesterday, I referred to that example, which became a standard for how companies should interact with indigenous peoples. The policy of this company includes one of the articles of the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples with a reference to consent to operations on the part of indigenous peoples. The last example I would like to give you is my own people, as I mentioned, 1989, when the land was leased to South Korea, we managed to reverse this decision of the government. And then a few years later, we received an official document from the government of the Russian Federation that the land is leased by our community for the term of 49 years. In September this year, our community was adamant 
not to have any industrial project in our area, even though we have resources of gold, coal, timber. However, we insist that the area uh, is a natural preserve. Nonetheless, about a month ago, the president of Russia did not make the decision until only one month ago. The decision was made to have this area as a natural preserve with conservation of all resources fully governed by our community. This is a success story, and success stories are unfortunately few and far between. I think they are so rare. Uh, this is not the only reason, but probably the major reason is that the potential of indigenous peoples is underused. We need to increase this potential in terms of education, other aspects of work to enable indigenous peoples to make their own decisions about the kind of life they want to live. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question here online that's actually a, a pretty provocative question, so I'll ask Christina to answer it first. It's from the UN Department of Public Information and the NGO Relations Office. And the question is, how can NGOs step up the pressure on violations against human rights defenders working in this context when such violations are increasing? Um, and this is a question I'm tempted to throw out to the audience too because I'm sure there are a lot of opinions on it, but I'll stick with the panel initially. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Uh, how can NGOs step up the pressure against on violations against human rights defenders as those violations are increasing? Well, um, it's complicated. My job is at risk now, so. Um, well, I, I think that initiatives like the Mesoamerican uh, Network and other organizations are working to be very close to human rights defenders who are at risk. Uh, we are trying to make more coalitions and denouncing what is the particular situation. We are also innovating and works like the Interna International Service for Human Rights that are innovating the ways of presenting the information and the impacts on the local scenarios. It's helping to show what is really happening. I think one of the obstacles is trying to present re the reality of how the companies are working in the regions where the projects are trying to be installed. The second is that how we can assure that the, the impact of, we are talking a lot of, of the aggressions and attacks that human rights defenders suffer, and particularly women human rights defenders are object, uh, suffer also. But the problem is, what about the prevention and what about the protection in these moments? Because it's, it's been quite a problem in the last years that the impacts of the aggression in human rights defenders is that they cannot still work in, in the regions. So they have to go out of the countries, they have to change their way of life, they have to, and this is having a really impact in the, in the work that they are doing and the, in the and it's making, uh, facilitating the process for the, for the companies and for the states. And I would like to make a parenthesis in this one because I believe that uh, the resolution now gives an important framework to this to, to achieve a better goals for the protection of women human rights defenders who are working in this context. And um, finally, something I believe that it's complicating all the measures that we can achieve is that it seems that in, when we talk about this issue, it appears a conflict of interest between the state and the companies. And for NGOs and for human rights defenders, finally, the responsibility to protect is for the, from the states. 
So we need to continue pressuring that the implementation of effective measures of, for protection has to be done by the state. And the companies also have to be responsible, but at the same time, NGOs can work with, with the state to facilitating and to guarantee uh, better conditions. Um, do either of you have, would you like to? Just uh, a word or two that I'd like to add here. I thought that Christina was absolutely correct. The first thing, I think, where the strength of NGOs and civil society lies is in openness and in their public nature. I think that it is this open and public nature of processes which are being carried out by the NGOs. Therein lies their strength because it is indeed most regrettable that some forces, in fact, play under the table and are playing dishonestly. And in order to win, NGOs have to, in fact, put that all out on the table. It has to be open and transparent. And Christina also mentioned this in her statement, that is the need for the creation of coalitions. For example, indigenous peoples very often and practically always are in a coalition with the human rights defenders organizations and with the ecological environmental organizations. Just to add on what uh, the others have brought up, I think <clears throat> every time the human rights defenders are faced with such repression, difficult times, they, they don't give up. They, they, you don't give up. You just have to strategize on what else can you do. At the national level, as we talk, we need to do more. We need, for example, education. We need, we need to sensitize our governments. We need to, to put more pressure on our governments. But we need also, as civil society, to learn to use the regional and international mechanisms which are available to us. Um, at, if we are going to do that, we need to learn to document and report. Once you document, you report, then you bring up these issues at the international or regional level. And I think I've seen the pressures sometimes from the international level really working on particular countries. If we are going to get concerted efforts from the international level, put pressures on some of the governments. And they learn from each other too. And I must say, with the introduction of their universal periodical review, where countries are being reviewed and some of these issues are brought, I would encourage civil society to ensure that some of these issues see their way into the reports which come up at the United Nations, so that when the country is being reviewed, it's made accountable and it makes its voluntary pledges of some of the things it's going to do, and one of them will be to really take into account some of these issues. So participate in those activities, get the universal periodical review, get your reports, get your thematic reports to the treaty bodies. So it will be good for you to learn to use the mechanisms so that these mechanisms can be used within your states to put pressure. And I've seen where pressure has worked. Some of the countries which wanted to pass very offensive laws and pressure uh, prevailed and the countries had to abandon such, such initiatives. So let's not um, overlook pressure from the international community. Thank you. I, I just wanted to let everybody know the third committee is coming back here at three. So we actually have about 10 more minutes um, and we can take a few questions in that time. And before I, I go to the floor, I just wanted to exercise a bit of moderator's prerogative on this last question, which is, in our view, no matter what civil society does, there will never be enough civil society to monitor the world in this area. And that is why we try to emphasize the importance of rules, standards, and due diligence on the part of governments, companies, and multilateral organizations to 
to not just police themselves, but to be accountable for it. Because as much as civil society can do, and it can do more, it will never be the solution to this issue. So I, I just say that while, while there's plenty to do, there, rules are always helpful in this regard as well. Um, but with that, I saw somebody in the back there that had a question, so I'll go right there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sally Dunn, and I am an NGO representative here at the UN. I represent the Loretto Committee. And um, my NGO is a member of the uh, working group on mining, uh, consisting of a number of NGOs who are quite concerned about these very issues that we're discussing. Um, so our advocacy work here at the UN consists of um, advocating for a human rights-based approach to the extractives development model. And I'm, I'm quite interested in hearing uh, comments from the panel about a concern that I think all of us on the, the mining working group here would have, and that is that we believe that the, in the consultation phase, in the planning phase for some of these major projects, um, there is a room for consideration of the potential human rights violations that a major project would inflict on local peoples. And we believe that there are times when the human rights considerations need to outweigh the economic or development uh, potential benefits of a project and determine that that project should not be pursued. And I guess I'm, I'm interested to know, do you all know of any cases where that has indeed happened, where, where the violation of human rights was deemed to be simply unacceptable? Um, Usually, all we talk about is what are, what are companies going to do to try to minimize the human rights violations or to try to mitigate or compensate for. But we believe very strongly that, that human rights violations are, are something that should be a stop sign to some of these major developments. And I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've just learned they need the room a little bit sooner than possible. So what I'm going to do is ask if Pavel has an answer to this question, and then we'll have to wrap it up, unfortunately. I think that, of course, human rights are indeed a, a sacred cow here and of course it would be very important to be sure that those rights are never violated but experience keeps showing us that unfortunately this is very far from the case so i think that what you're doing here what you're engaged in and what in principle we too are engaged in is moving towards a situation in which if we could, can't eliminate all violations of human rights, we can at least reduce them to a bare minimum. And once again, I want to emphasize that our objective here, our goal, is to eradicate all violations of human rights. And, but experience has been showing us that this is a very lengthy, protracted, and cumbersome process. And I also believe that if there is any kind of deed or project that does violate human rights, then my own civic position is that that kind of project should be stopped. And it was already mentioned on previous issues that companies are sometimes major taxpayers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and therefore Nobody's going to stop some projects just because of a few small groups of indigenous peoples. But of course, we understand that these communities, they're not that very many, they're not numerous. But aren't they citizens of those countries too, these groups of indigenous peoples? Aren't they human beings just to the same extent as other citizens of a country? That's why I think that in any case, in each specific case, you have to treat each case specifically, individually, and in my view, those kinds of violations should be excluded. Thank you very much. Uh, we are 
Uh, we will need to wrap up now just because of the time pressure. So I just wanted to thank all of our panelists who have taken the time today and thank the Government of Norway and the International Service for Human Rights for organizing this session. And thanks to all of you, both, both in the room and online, who participated and asked questions. Thank you again.